This afternoon we have the State Board of Accounts presenting. We have three presenters this afternoon. Uh, we're going to start with Bill Vinson, who's going to talk about special investigations at the State Board of Accounts. And after that, uh, I can't remember if it's Todd or Susan, but we're going to have a presentation on the corrective action plans and also the gateway upload. So we'll start with Bill. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good to be here. Uh, I'm here to talk about special investigations, as she said, and uh, special investigations is a, a kind of a sub-department of the State Board of Accounts that was created five years ago uh, when Paul Joyce, the state examiner, became uh, our boss. Uh, he wanted to uh, move some folks over into a specialized area called special investigations, and that was done for a couple of reasons. Special investigations deal with uh, shortage and fraud and theft audits that we may run across. Mm -hmm. And in the past, uh, what would happen is if you were a field examiner and you were out doing an audit, you came across a theft or a shortage, you would kind of focus your energy on that theft and, and determine everything that needed to be gathered in order to prove that theft, um, sometimes to the detriment of actually getting the audit report completed because that audit report still needed to be done. And uh, so by moving some folks over into special investigations, if a field examiner is out now and they find a problem, they can refer it to us. They can continue on with their audit report, get it finished, and, and move it on to the office for processing. And the special investigation folks can then deal with the shortage or the, or the theft. Um, and the second reason for it is, is that as a field examiner, you may go five, six, seven years on audits and before you run into some sort of a, a theft or a shortage. And then you'd have to remember, okay, well now six years ago, what did I have to gather in order to prove my uh, case here for the theft or the shortage? Whereas we in the Special Investigations Unit, that's all we're doing now. So we pretty much know what it is we need to gather to be able to prove the shortage uh, for civil uh, collection through the Attorney General's office or sometimes referral to the prosecutor's office in that local county uh, for criminal prosecution. And so um, our division has a hierarchy and, and uh, the director of special investigations is Mark Mahon. And he's not been with us very long. He's, he joined us in 2016 after 20 years with the FBI and he dealt with a lot of different things in the FBI, not the least of which was public corruption and fraud. So he understands that and he's more in tune to the criminal side of things than, than just civil charges or actually even the audit reports themselves. So, uh, but he's the guy who uh, we ultimately answer to and he's the person who's in the office that, that helps coordinate the investigations from there. And uh, if you need, if you want to take down his contact information to be able to get a hold of him should something arise and you feel like you need to contact the Board of Accounts, that's his, uh, phone number and the uh, email address for him. And then um, we've got two coordinators, uh, one for the north, one for the south. And the uh, southern coordinator is Tammy Baker, and she's been on since 1992. She's worn a lot of different hats for the agency. She's worked both in the office and out in the field, uh, anywhere from being a field examiner now to being a special investigations coordinator. And she has uh, six or seven people uh, that, that are under her that she uh, assigns and reviews their work and so forth. And she covers the Southern District. And her contact information, if you happen to be a library in the Southern Half, and I'll get you a map here in a minute so you'll know whether you're in the Southern Half or not. Um, that's her contact information. And then the coordinator for the Northern Half of the state is Dean Gerlock. Dean's been around since 1980, so he's one of the more grizzled folks. Uh, he uh, has also worn a lot of hats as, as a field examiner, field supervisor, and now he's the coordinator over the special investigations, has seven or eight people, again, under him that report to him, and he reviews their work and so forth. His contact info, if you are a northern half library, you might want to jot that down. I'll leave that up there for just a second, and we'll move on. And then just for those of you who are really interested to know who I am again, my name is Bill Vinson. I'm the senior special investigator of the northern half. And I've been on since 79, so I don't know how grizzled that makes me. But uh, 
Uh, I've also done a lot of different things. Uh, more recently, gotten into the special investigations. But prior to there being a special investigations uh, unit, I dealt with a lot of uh, fraud and charges as well. And I'm in the north, but um, I don't necessarily always work there. There's my contact information, by the way. And uh, I am a senior special investigator. I don't, it's not because I'm old, I don't think. Uh, they didn't tell me. I tried to get a different title, but they wouldn't let me have one. I wanted a high exalted special investigator. Didn't work. They wouldn't go for that. There's the map. And the folks over there on the left, those are the folks that are the special investigators. Uh, it's got each of the coordinators listed again, and then the individuals who uh, work under those coordinators. But the little star you see over there in Delaware County, that's where I live. So being right there at the line, I'm, I've worked in both areas. I was uh, talking with Todd and Susan just a little bit ago, and I was down in Switzerland County just the other day and could look out and see the Ohio River. So uh, I, I do quite a bit of traveling. Um, and just for food for thought, the folks that deal with the Northern District just to let you know the experience factor for them, those people that are listed there, uh, the average years of experience is 31 years there. So they've seen a few things. And the folks, they're a lot younger in the South. They only have 22 years of combined experience or average experience. So they, uh, uh, they're just junior to us at the North. So They're asking me to put your contact information up again, but okay. maybe I could just type it into the chat. That'd be fine. Let me... Okay, let me type that in there. They're wanting mine. I'm not really that important. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, so it's in the chat, she says, so we'll move on then. Okay, this is the actual statute. Um, that is a requirement for all uh, governmental entities that uh, if someone in a governmental entity thinks there is a uh, reasonable uh, cause to believe that there's any kind of a theft or shortage or uh, misappropriation of funds or assets, they are required to report that to the State Board of Accounts uh, and also the local prosecuting attorney in that, uh, in that county. Uh, and what I try to tell people is, um, you know, if you're not sure, it doesn't hurt to report it. And I'll get onto that why a little bit. But, uh, you know, something looks a little hinky. You're not really sure. Uh, you can't get a good explanation for something. Maybe it's something we need to look at. It may be nothing. Um, one thing I can tell you when we do come out to do these investigations, the first thing we do is if it's reported to us, it's logged in uh, in our office. Mark Mahon takes a look at it. It's then sent out. And one of our special investigators then actually goes and does an assessment. We'll look at what you're seeing, and if we think there's something to that, then we'll uh, recommend that we actually do an investigation on it. It may not be anything, and if that's the case, we would either recommend it just to be data filed, or there might just be some control issues that need to be addressed, something like that. So um, the one thing that I can tell you is, is that when we come out, we just all we're looking for is the truth. Whatever it is that happened, that's what we're looking for. So. If it's nothing, that's what we're going to tell you. If it is something, we'll tell you that too, and we'll deal with it. All right, and yes, theft at the governmental level does happen. I've got a few examples here. I've got a county auditor who was using the county credit card for personal items, and you can see it was a six-figure, six-figure theft. Um, got somebody at a utility that decided not to deposit the utility collections, and again, it was six figures. Um, here's another credit card uh, abuse problem, and she outdid the uh, county auditor. It took over $275,000 here uh, just using the school's credit card. Um, this one's a little different. Again, this is one of those where you might decide it looks something looks a little funny about it, but you can't put your finger on exactly why. This was a maintenance director. He'd taken kickbacks from a vendor, and those kickbacks were over $100,000. But the bigger, the bigger problem for that was is that this vendor, in order to make up the $100,000, they were 
overcharging the, the school for the items they were selling to them, and that basically cost the school an extra $800,000 plus dollars, uh, in cost that they wouldn't have had to pay had they used a different vendor. <laughs> Uh, this one here, uh, a township trustee, CFO, or bookkeeper stole over $300,000 using a dummy checking account. And in, in the interest of full disclosure, that CFO used to work for the State Board of Accounts. And so there's a lot. those are a lot of high-profile cases. We do a lot of them that will be anywhere from $1,000 to $10,000. Um, and some of you may or may not remember, but back in the 80s, there was a library that close to $500,000, it was well over $400,000 in theft to the library. So it can happen. It doesn't happen often, but it happens often enough to keep 16 of us busy. Now why would people steal? Because just about every, not every time, but just about every time, the people that we have found who have taken money uh, or abused credit cards, and credit cards are a big deal. You really need to watch those. I'm just throwing that out there as a side comment. but. We have a, I've dealt with three issues with credit cards this first six months of this year alone. But uh, invariably they'll say, well, I just, I can't believe this person would have done it. They're such a nice person. But there are reasons that they, that they do take. And uh, it could be that you could have uh, illness or injury in the family, uh, maybe a family member lost their job, uh, college debt for their kids. You know, they got to pay that tuition. I'm doing that now, and it's not cheap. Uh, maybe they're upset with the unit they're working for because they felt like they deserved a raise and they didn't get it, so they'll just help themselves to some of the money to make up for that. Um, and thinking that they're actually just borrowing the money. Uh, in fact, I've got uh, one situation that I did not too terribly long ago that number one, two, and five was the same person. They had a lot of expenses uh, related to her husband who had had a heart attack, and because of it, he lost his job. They had a lot of medical expenses at the same time that their daughter was going through a nasty divorce and high legal bills, and she borrowed money from the utilities, and she paid it back probably a half a dozen times. But every time she would pay it back with her paycheck, well, then she had nothing to live on for the next two weeks, so she would turn around and borrow again. Eventually, it became too big for her to pay back, and uh, it ended up getting into the, over almost $30,000. So, And here's some other reasons that you don't always know about. Uh, those That first page was are kind of the red flag things. They don't mean that every, just because somebody has a lost uh, job for their spouse or somebody in the family is sick or they've got debt that they're going to steal money. Uh, but people might know about those things, and they would be red flags. Uh, these are some of the things maybe that you don't know about a co-worker who might be apt to take money, and it would be that they might have an addiction to either drugs or gambling. Um, you know, they've been blackmailed and they have to give the money up, or they're just they're just greedy. Um, I, over the years that I have worked on the board of accounts, I kind of classify uh, officials in three ways, and, and there's a large percentage of them that are the high moral character. Uh, official who would starve rather than take a penny and gets upset if their reconcilement's off by a penny. And that's just, you just know that's the kind of person they are. And then there's the other end of the spectrum, which isn't a very large group, that the minute you would turn your back, they would take money because they have no moral character. And then most everybody else fits in that middle category. And you're not really sure who they are until it happens. And that's that one where they didn't take the job to steal money. They have no intention of taking money. But some trigger happens that makes them rationalize that, well, I need it for now, and I can put it back. And uh, so those are the kind of the things I've run across in my time with the Board of Accounts. But why why should you contact us? I mean, you don't want to squeal on your coworkers. You don't want to get anybody in trouble unnecessarily. As I said before, we don't jump to conclusions. Uh, we don't deal with newspaper articles or, or any of those kinds of things that the media might sensationalize. All we're after is the truth. And so when you call us, we're not going to come out there and uh, run rough shot off anybody. We're just going to look at the records and see what it is we can find. Uh, we don't share the investigation with anyone. It's just like your regular audit report. It's not official until it comes out of the office in Indianapolis. And so we don't, 
We don't release it to the press or anybody else until it's official from the office. Uh, we do work with law enforcement. We've worked with the Indiana State Police and the FBI, and we've been involved with a lot of local agencies as well, uh, especially if a unit has contacted their local police department to have them come in and look at something that might be a, a shortage. We are independent, so we don't come in with any kind of a bias. Uh, we don't care what your politics are. You know, we, we're nerdy accountants. We like good records. That's what we like. So that's all we care about, really. Okay, good internal controls. I'm sure that Todd and Susan have talked about internal controls in the past. You'll have it beat into you more uh, as they move on into the future, but good internal controls equals prevention. It doesn't uh, guarantee prevention, but it, it does help. And uh, these things that are on the screen here, ensuring that no one person have control over all the parts of a transaction. You know, that should the same person shouldn't be opening the mail writing the receipt, posting the receipt, preparing the deposit, making the deposit, doing the bank reconcilement, uh, you know, posting the records, all those kinds of things shouldn't be in one person's hands. Now, I realize some libraries are pretty small, and you're going to have that issue. You can't help it, but that's where you have to come up with other means of oversight. Uh, board members who will review the bank reconcilements, board members who will review uh, the deposits and the receipts, things like that to try to mitigate uh, the, the problems. Uh, and the issue of internal controls, a lot of people uh, have a misperception of what that really is. It doesn't mean that you aren't trustworthy or that they don't trust you. Uh, internal controls are in place for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is the obvious one. It, it helps protect the unit from loss. And when you have controls that make it very difficult for somebody to take money, then the risk of loss to the unit is minimized. But the other thing it does, and this is the part that a lot of officials and the bookkeepers don't realize, is that it protects the reputation of the bookkeeper. If you have no controls, if you are that person that opens the mail, writes the receipt, posts the receipt to the records, makes the deposit, and does the bank rec, and someone then says, well, gee, I think there should be more money there, maybe you've taken some. What do you have to prove them wrong? You know, you can't say, well, so-and-so oversees what I do. Uh, so the, the character of the bookkeeper can be unnecessarily uh, damaged just because there's no controls. So having those controls, if I were a bookkeeper anywhere, I would want as many as I could have because I don't want anybody saying that about me. So when you hear about internal controls, it's not that they don't trust you. It is meant to protect you as well as the unit. All right, so what do you do if you suspect a loss? Well, I've already given you Mark, Tammy, and Dean's contact information and mine. But uh, your folks who are the office directors over libraries, Todd and Susan, they've got a uh, kind of a joint library uh, email. This is one that they both have access to, so this is the best one to um, contact them through because if one's out, it goes into both the inboxes. So, And then I also went ahead and put the um, email address or the uh, website for the State Board of Accounts. Uh, there's a lot of useful information there, uh, as well as there's a link to look at audit reports. And if you're all that interested in looking at what some charge reports look like, you can browse through issued reports and look for the ones that say uh, with charges. And that will... Uh, let you see some of the ways in which people are getting themselves in trouble. Uh, with that, if there's anybody that's got any questions, I'll be glad to answer them if I can. Anybody online? Nope. Then we're good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. All right, we're going to continue with Susan Gordon, who is the um, supervisor of cities and towns. Director, I'm sorry, Director of Cities and Towns. And did, did we bring yours up? No, that's not it.
All right, we're going to make a presentation. Oh. And then we're going to change it. It's all yours. Hi, everybody. This is Susan Gordon. I'm sorry for the delay there. I'm not uh, very tech savvy like a lot of you out there, but uh, we'll make it through. Um, today we're going to talk about a lot of different topics. Normally we talk about new legislation and we have that information prepared for today. But um, in order to address probably the most pressing concerns, we wanted to start with the new Gateway um, Upload Project. I'm sure all of you got an email uh, or memorandum sometime in June, maybe around June 12th, and uh, may have a lot of questions about that. So. How we plan to start out is I'm going to go ahead and give a brief overview of the reasons for that uh, and, and what we have uh, found so far with that. And then uh, Todd's going to come up and he's going to do a demonstration through the Gateway application so you can see how it works. And then, of course, we will take all the, the questions that, that you want to uh, ask uh, during this time. We want to make sure we take as much time as necessary we're, while we're all here together. Uh, to address any concerns or questions that you have. So um, we'll get started with that. Oh, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, the slides that I'm going through were prepared by Summer Cannon. She's our Director of Engagement Strategies. She's also uh, the point person on the remote audit process and this upload project. Um, so we were grateful for her um, for doing that. And also, as you as we go through these slides, please keep in mind it's it's talking about two things that are very closely related. One is the Gateway Upload Project, which you've all been um, you you all read about in your email. The other one is remote auditing and the concept of auditing more um, through the computer, which is why we need this this upload uh, information. So kind of got two projects going on at the same time, and this, these slides address both of those. <coughs> um, just to give you a little background, the overriding principle on this entire process is to optimize the local government audit process. Um, State Examiner Paul Joyce has, has tasked us all with kind of reimagining and re-engineering our entire audit concept from the preliminary audit planning stages all the way through to when we file the report. And one of the overriding um, things that we're thinking about is the use of technology, um, how we use technology currently in our procedures and how we can use technology to its fullest capacity. So that's kind of where this is coming from. Um, and, and as a result of that and, and of our, our office working together, we are on the verge of some very exciting uh, changes. So that's what we want to share with you today. We'll still be um, doing the same uh, quality audits that we have done in the past according to the same standards, but they might just look a little different with the use of technology. So we'll move on to the slides. Okay, the, some of the goals that we have through this is that we'll conduct more planning and audit work prior to the start of an engagement, and that will allow for a more efficient audit process. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, we're going to try and conduct more audit procedures from a remote location so that we're not on site at your unit as many days as we are currently. And we'll try to con conduct audit procedures in real time so that we can be quicker at providing the assistance that you need um, to do your jobs well in the um, financial accountability. So we're hoping that through these um, new procedures it'll result in less cost to you um, because we'll be on site less time, we'll be able to get the information sooner uh, and do some preliminary work. It also should be more flexible for you because again we won't be on site, you'll have time to get the records available for us. Um, the, the end goal, I think, for this, uh, we're going to gradually work toward this, is to be 80% off-site, uh, but we would still come in and do an entrance conference. Uh, we would do some testing on-site, and we would also have an exit conference. But a lot of the information that we'll need will be uploaded through this gateway application. 
Um, the first step that uh, we needed in achieving these goals was to develop a secure platform where you can upload documents on a periodic basis or as needed for an audit. And that application is in Gateway titled the Monthly and Annual Engagement Uploads. One frequent question that we have is whether this particular application in Gateway is accessible by the public. And the answer to that is no. It is, it is only for State Board of Accounts purposes for your audits. We have been conducting a pilot project with 11 governmental units. We have uh, five, six small towns and five libraries uh, to conduct non-federal audits on a remote basis. And through this process, we're trying to identify checkpoints in the project um, so that we can decide what works best from a remote location and what things we really do need to go on site to do. And uh, we have greatly appreciated the help that we've received and the feedback so far uh, from these pilot units. We are going to be asking for some files to be uploaded on a monthly basis and then some files to be uploaded on an annual basis. And uh, that information is here on this slide. On a monthly basis, we're going to ask for your bank reconcilement. That is just the reconcilement itself. It's not the bank statements or the canceled checks. Um, we'll, we'll ask for supporting documentation on the December uh, bank reconcilement, but not for your monthly uh, reconcilements. We do need copies of approved board minutes to be uploaded into the Gateway application. If you already have those on your library's website, you can just provide a link to those board minutes so you don't have to actually upload them. And then also uh, the funds ledger. And there has been some confusion on what that means. So the fields that we're looking for is for each fund, we need beginning balance, total receipts, total disbursements, and ending balance per, by fund for the month. Can that be an Excel report that we type of? Like um, the, it, is it just the summary, just the total <coughs> the month, or the details? We do not need the detail. We are looking for the totals. So you're saying the, le um, the ledger can be a report that just shows you the details? It is the funds report. Is that correct? Not the, not the detail. Not the detail. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. not the detail. Okay. So it's just the balance. Just the totals. The yes. Totals. I guess I was asking, it doesn't have to be a document straight out of the accounting software, does it? Could it be something created? If, if that's, what is the answer to that? Is if that's the only method that they have? If that's the only method that you have, yes. We, if possible, if it's possible to upload it directly from your system, then that would be the preferred method. Okay. That my mm -hmm. Yes? I just want to clarify for the monthly reports on the funds ledger, it should be June 1st, June 30th, not January 1st. June. We're starting with the beginning date of that month and not going all the way back to January each time. Yes, the, the question is are we, is it on a per month basis? So, yes, we're looking for July 1st to June 30th. Um, beginning balance, ending balance, total receipts, and total disbursements for that month. Every month they want you to be the first date of that month. That's correct. Okay, thank you. All right, there was a question about the minutes. Do those have to be the signed minutes? Those do need to be the signed minutes, yes. Yes. I have a question. I I am not aware of being put on hold okay. for the ma monthly updates. Did anybody else get that information? Okay. Yeah. Oh, it might be different for you. Whatever your field examiners or summer have has um, instructed you in in the pilot project to do, then yeah. The, um, everyone else starts July first. Yeah. Yes, the month. Just in case you were wondering, the monthly. Um, if you if you checked um, when you first got the email to see if the application was open, it wasn't at that time, but it is now. So you can get in there and enter your information. So we have to 
Uh, the question was, we need to make sure we have June entered. The project actually starts with information in July. So it would be your July information is due September 15th. It is strongly um, encouraged, if possible, to go back and enter in the other months for 2018. This is everyone. This is everyone. Yes. There was an email sent out. I think, I think it was dated June 12th. Um, we'll get with you and, and see why you may not have gotten that. It did go to gateway submitters, so, um, so it might be to your treasurer. It might have gone to your treasurer instead of you. Are you set up as an editor, maybe? In I think myself and my treasurer are both set up. Okay. If, if you didn't get this email, you might want to check your spam folder because we have heard that some of them have gone to spam. And if you can add the contacts of um, uh, gateway at sboa.in.gov to, um, to your contact list, then maybe that won't happen again. But is we, there a way to put something on the in though? Because if we don't know this is happening, and we didn't come to this, the, the workshop today, and we don't know that this To, to put it on, on where, did you say? We have an in-pub. I don't know if it's something the state library could we're talking about the We're talking about the in-pub? Yes, in-pub lib. Um, we just have no reason to even know what's going on. Uh, well, we're talking about the in-pub lib. Yeah, we're talking about the I understand that you wanted to know about an announcement of that email, and I'm afraid I, I was out of the loop on that too, but I recently sent out the information, a communication from the State Board of Accounts in, in, in relationship to that, and I know that, you know, that doesn't make good on what has happened in the past, but I'll try to keep on top of that and, and, and see what those are in the anticipation. And it was recommended um, that that we make sure Karen has a copy of all the emails that come from our office, and we will do that from now on. So we apologize if you did not get it, get that email. We'll uh, try and get that to you through that method as well. Yes, annual reports at sboa.in.gov is where the information came from. What date was that? Um, I have a follow-up email that's from June 21st that says it's now available. Okay. Do you original one was June 12th? Okay. So look for something in your folder from annual reports at sboa.in.gov. All right, we have several questions. Uh, the one is in regard to minutes that we have the link. Uh, the ones we post online don't have the signature. So what's your response to that if it doesn't have the signature for the one that's a uh, hyperlink? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we will uh, pose that to Summer and see if that is acceptable for her. Uh, and then we'll get that in the user guide for the monthly upload application. So the question was, um, if you have a, you have a link to the board minutes, but those board minutes are not signed. So we'll find out that the answer to that question for you. They want to know if we submit this information, will you let us know if it's correct? Right but now we are correct. accepting the information information and it will be used in our preliminary audit planning. If there is information that is not um, supplied, uh, then I'm, I'm assuming that our office will get with you and let you know that we're missing a piece of information. But once Todd gets up here to do the live demonstration, you'll, under, you'll see that um, you'll be able to tell if it's been uploaded and uploaded properly. It'll, it'll identify it as, a, as checked off. Uh, the other the question is, you know, uh, usually minutes aren't approved until the following month. Uh, so, how will, is this okay? Or and if it's a month later, on, you know, the the July information, so the July board minutes aren't due to be uploaded until September. So the because they have we have that delay in there, so that you'll have time to get all of the information together, the bank reconciliation done, the board minutes signed, and so forth. So we're hoping that. You know, if they're approved at the next 
meeting in August, then they'll be available for uploading by September 15. And then just one more question. Why is it necessary to send the year-end uh, dis disbursements if sent monthly? Yes, the, the monthly disbursements are in total. The year-end will be a detailed listing of disbursements. All right, thank you. Okay, so on this, the, we kind of went through the monthly uh, information, the bank reconcilement, uh, the approved board minutes, and the funds ledger. Yes. Um, on an annual basis, uh, we will need the year-end bank statement and the year-end outstanding checklist, investment statements, your detail of receipts for the year. If you have, uh, that does not apply if you have hand-posted records. The detail of disbursements for the year. Again, if you don't have, if you have hand-posted records, that particular one does not apply. And Todd will go through that uh, in greater detail in a few minutes. We'll need your salary ordinance for the year. So if you're filing your annual financial report for 2018, we need the 2018 salary ordinance because we want comparable information there. Uh, the employee earnings record and an annual vendor history report. Again, if you have hand-posted records, that vendor history report is not applicable. The question is about employee earnings record, and I think if I heard you right last time, I think it's 99B is the form. Yeah, it's, it's a form 99B, um, which shows the employees' gross wages and deductions and um, net pay by individual. What is the vendor history report? Uh, the vendor history report will be a detail that your uh, software can um, put together. So it would show all payments to uh, Visa, for example, or all payments to your local book publisher. Um, so it would be actually a, a history or a, a detail of your disbursements by vendor. Yes. Okay, and so we have a, a, a large library that's doing a CAFA report. Um, we can talk about your specific situation. Um, I don't know that there are any exceptions to um, putting all of this information in Gateway, but you might want to talk to Summer Cannon about your particular situation. Yeah, the uh, if you want to if you want a phone number, it's three one seven two three two. 2513. Or if you want to email that to our library's inbox, uh, we'll send that to Summer for you okay. if you have particular questions because you do have an unusual situation. But again, we have not been told that there will be any exceptions to um, this being filed. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. And Todd reminded me for you in particular because you're a CAFR audit, we would be doing your audit on site. So uh, the remote audit process would not apply to you. No, that, no, that there's two different things going on. One of them is the monthly or the upload project, and that does allow us to do a lot of preliminary audit planning. Uh, the remote audit would be um, us doing the audit again from a different location and probably requesting records through this gateway application, but um, this applies to everyone. Okay. okay. Okay, I think we've been through this part of it. The July files, which that's when we're starting, would be due September 15th. So we're trying to give a couple of months there to get all of the information together. Uh, we are starting with July. If you can go back and go ahead and enter the information you have for January through June, that would be fabulous. Uh, but we are starting with July as the requirement. So you can see the deadlines that we have here always um, two months out in the middle of the month. And then the annual files are due March 1st.
along with the annual financial report. As a part of the remote audit process, there is a direct request feature uh, where our field examiners, because they're going to be operating remotely, they'll be able to send a request to you for certain items that they might need uh, during the engagement. So the application will prompt an email to be sent to you uh, from a no reply gateway address that will ask you to upload pieces of information into the uh, gateway application. An example of this would be maybe our field examiners would like to look at a particular contract that you have. So they may request that you upload that contract so that they can take a look at it remotely. Um, we've had some questions on does this mean that you know all of my uh, disbursements that you're going to test or my receipts that you're going to test, you know, the individual receipts and invoices have to be uploaded. Field examiners will probably pull that information. That might be one thing they would do on site. Um, but um, it will just depend on, on your particular audit. But they, they may, di may um, directly request information through that uh, application. And Todd will show you again more about that uh, on a live demonstration in a few minutes. So once we work through the pilot engagements, and I think we're, um, we're moving right along in that, we're going to compile the information that we have and how the new audit process will work. And we'll have more information for you in the November workshops as uh, you know this process gets fine-tuned a little bit. OK, a specific so. question about submission. I have edit rights, but not submission rights. Will I be able to upload this information? Yes, a person with edit uh, rights will be able to upload this information. Okay. Any other questions right no, now? That's okay, Todd's going to come up now and uh, show you how this works on the application. <coughs> We're just going to close this one. Okay. Yeah. going to close it. Yeah. And then you can open yours. We'll close this I'm one. Gonna go online first. <coughs> hmm? I'm going to go online first. You're going to go yeah, online. Yeah. Well, you want to go there? Go to Google Chrome. All right, good afternoon, everyone. And while this pulls up, I'm going to um, walk you through uh, the monthly upload, what that kind of looks like. Um, maybe put your minds at, at ease a little bit. It, it, I think it's fairly easy once you get your documents or your reports in an uploadable format. That may be the biggest uh, hurdle that you run into because just getting it uploaded um, is pretty easy. So we'll walk through that and then I'll walk through what if you were having a remote audit done or an off-site audit and those direct requests that come in, what those will look like, what the emails will look like, what they ask for, and just kind of walk through that. So let me get to the gateway. So you're probably familiar with this page. This is the, the home page for the gateway. And you log in over here by clicking there and entering your username. Which mine's already populated here. Now when you get to this area that you're familiar with when you're entering stuff for DLGF or over here on the Board of Accounts side like the 100 r or your annual report, you're going to see uh, this section, the monthly and annual engagement uploads. And we're going to click on that in a second and, and go through some of that, but I kind of jumped ahead of myself. I want to go back up to the user guides up here. Just like we have a user guide for the 100 r and the annual report, there's a user guide for the monthly uploads. So if you click on the user guide link and scroll down to the monthly and annual engagement uploads user guide, there's a lot of good information here that we're covering today. So if, you know when you get ready to do this for the first time or maybe the second time, you've got questions, you might refer here first. You might find your answer um, before you have to wait on us to get back with you for with a phone call or or anything else. But there's Good information there. If you don't want to scroll all the way through it, you can just click on these links at the at the top, and it'll take you directly there. Probably the really good one just to look through is the frequently asked questions. And I know we're 
even continuing to update those as we go through some of these these workshops or with some of the other units that we've met with and some of the questions they've posed. So I just wanted to point that out that there is a user guide and it is handy so you might want to consider taking a look at that. All the way out, sorry. So I'm going to click on the monthly and annual engagement uploads like I talked about. And then you get the screen for the units that you're assigned to. So I'm assigned to this test unit, this test library. And when you click through those screens, you'll get to the, the main page for the monthly upload. This is where you're going to find all of your information. Um, there's some brief instructions there, but this is where you're going to do your, your monthly uploads. Um, start right in this area right here, the select upload group. And there's just simply a drop down and you pick the month that you're going to do. So we'll just go ahead and select July. And then it'll list the three types of documents that we're asking for in the monthly uploads, the reconcilement, the board minutes, and the funds ledger. I'm going to pick, let me see which one we haven't done yet. I'm going to pick the board minutes. When you click on the board minutes, uh, you'll get this message that, that says you may provide the link, like Susan mentioned. So if you do have a link, you can uh, simply insert it here instead of actually uploading your minutes. You'll click on link, your web link there, and it'll ask you to copy the link there. If you don't have your minutes on, on your website, then you'll click on the file upload. So you're going to actually upload a document here. And the types of files that you can upload are listed right here next to where it says upload file. Uh, Excel files, uh, Word files, JPEG, PDFs, GIFs, TIFs, and PNGs. I don't even know what those last two are. But um, if, you, if there's some other um, extension or format out there that you use that would be handy to you, it, it's a simple fix on our end to be able to accept that kind of a document and just let our gateway people know. And, and they've said they can do what they need to do to be able to accept that. But those are the ones that they're the most um, familiar with. So to upload uh, these board minutes, I'm going, let me go back and show you what the other options are too. If you do the bank rack and sum, it doesn't give you any questions in this area. You'll just go and choose the file. Your fund ledger is the same way. So really the only message you're going to get is the board minutes. That's why I wanted to pick that one to just show you that, that you will get um, some narrative there and, and some action to take whether you click the file upload or the web link. To choose the file, you, you'll select to choose the file and it will take you back to where your files are on your computer. I'm going to enlarge this a little bit just to make it easier for people to see. And I'm going to go to where I have maybe my upload at. And I thought I had a pair of board minutes or a file that said, I'll take a, this one. It's a, it's a file for Susan's that I used last um, And it's not a bank reconcilement, but just to show you, you click on that file. It inserts the name here. You click on the open and you can see next to the choose file, it's put the name of that file. So it shows you the file that you've chosen. You can make sure you've got the right one. Yours might say July bank reconcilement or July board minutes, whatever it says. And then you can just submit this upload. And once you do that, you'll get a message back if it was successful or not. Actually, I'm not sure what you'll get if it's not successful, but you get, you get a little confirmation that it did upload. Another way you can see or keep track of the files that you're required to upload is in this schedule here. It lists each month and those three documents, the, the bank reconcilement, the board minutes, and the funds ledger. When you've uploaded a document, it will list it here in the, right underneath the category, and you'll get a little check mark out to the next of it. So if you have a red X next to anything, that's something that you still have to upload. So it's a little reminder to you if you get your bank reconcilement done before the board minutes are ready, um, you won't have to remember, did I already upload 
you know that and, and try to do it again, this little checklist will show you whether you've done it or not. So I'll scroll down to July, the one that I just uploaded. And remember I said it was board minutes, so it shows I have uploaded this file name for the board minutes. It will also show you the date and the time of your upload and then the whoever logged in to do that. So I logged in as me and so it shows that in that area. It also has, you can click on um, this little icon here, it will show you the file that you, you've uploaded. So you can look at it if you need that extra verification that it actually got there, you can go look at it here. This feature will let you delete it. So if you, if you uploaded the wrong one, oops, I, I gave it a file name that I thought was the right one, but when I looked at it, it was actually the June reconcilement or the June board minutes. You can go here and delete it. Um, and I'll show you since the first workshop last week where I uploaded this document as a bank reconcilement, I'm going to go ahead and delete it and you'll see it'll make sure a verification. Do you want to delete this record? If I click OK, you can see now that's gone. I've got a red X there that still shows I haven't uploaded my July uh, reconcilement yet or my funds ledger. Got a question in the room? If you select the option to put the website mm -hmm. URL in there where all your board minutes are, does it automatically green check the minutes one each month? If you click on the web link and you copy the link in this place and then click on submit, it should give you a check mark over here and it should show uh, for your board minutes that you've, that you've uploaded the link. So do you have to provide a link to the exact month? To yes. The, to the, the board minutes page because we're a test one, and I thought that okay. the auditor said when they came out that we could just provide a link to our page where our minutes are, and then they would just go there each time to look at each month. The um, the question in the room was, do you have to provide a link to the actual monthly minutes, or can you just provide the link to the page? so that um, when we click on it, then we can go find if we're looking for April or October's. Um, we can get there from then. I think that's correct, that you can just provide the link to your your page on your website where your minutes are, and then we can go find the ones that we need. Um, but, but you would have to do that each month, I believe. And the reason if you didn't do that each month, I think Gateway is going to go through periodically and say, oh, we don't have one for this month and that month, and they will shoot you an email as a reminder that we don't have that. So you would have to do that each month. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, her question was, she's already, she's already done, it was more of a statement than a question, she's already done this, and this feature will allow you to upload more than one document. So, for example, if where I had done, uploaded the, these board minutes, if we had a special meeting in that month, I could upload that, those sets of minutes, and it would show two there. Or if you have more than one um, bank reconcilement, more than one bank account, and you do two reconcilement, one for each account, you can upload both of them. Or if you have, you know, 10, we're going to ask for all of those. So it would be all of your reconcilements. And you can do that. Some of the other features in, in Gateway, like on the annual report, back when you were doing risk assessments and uploading things, I think it would only allow you to do one or it would override it if you tried to upload something else where this is different. This, will, this feature will allow you to upload more than one file for whatever you call it, board minutes, or, you know, you can go back and do this. 40 times if you wanted to, just right in here. We have somebody asking the question about what if we don't have a monthly board meeting that month uh, for one reason or another. It does happen, but not often. What do we need to do? Yeah, if you don't have a, a meeting in a, for a particular month, um, you won't have anything to upload. You know, we have other types of units. Like a, like, a, like a large city might have a board or a commission that maybe only meets twice a year. So they're only going to upload the month that they have that meeting, you would have your six weeks, you know, until that September the 15th, if it was July, for example, to upload. So if you don't have one for a particular month, you're just going to have to note that, you know, you didn't meet for whatever reason. Maybe in the next set of minutes when you do meet, you can note that you, there wasn't a meeting the prior month. So we would see in Gateway why there wasn't. Um, 
an upload for that time. If you get an email reminder from Gateway because you didn't have a, um, a board meeting in a particular month, I'm not sure. It's a no reply email. So you might have to maybe shoot us, Susan or I, or Summer or somebody. We can, and that's probably something we can address in the frequently asked questions going forward is if you don't have a meeting, you don't have a quorum, or, or for whatever reason you don't have a meeting in a particular month that you would have had, um, what kind of a notification should we be getting or should you be doing? So there's the question about a, an executive session. Um, will, will that also need to be uploaded for the month if it applies? No. <clears throat> executive sessions at this point you wouldn't have to put in here um, because it's not a regular public meeting. We would, your normal board minutes would refer to an executive session being held. Um, and then at that time when we're reviewing those things that you have uploaded, if we need to see that, then we might send you a direct request for some information about that, that executive session. You know, was it advertised? Was it, you know, for the things you can have an exec executive session for, those types of things. All right. Thank you. So that's what the monthly part of this looks like. Um, in addition to these reminders, there's an annual upload reminder down here. So like we talked about before, the, the year-end bank statement, the year-end outstanding checklist, investment statements, those types of things. They'll, when you upload those or don't upload those, those will show the X's or the check marks down below. If I could go back up for a second. When you're doing your annual uploads, it's the same as the monthly where you start here. And you'll go down and click annual. And it'll, then your select, again, you'll have all of those things to choose from. Uh, when you do the bank statement, it's the same thing. You're going to provide the file. You're going to click where you're going to choose the file from and go select it and then upload it. I wanted to show also there are four that don't require the annual upload if you have cash or hand posted records. So I wanted to show some of those people that if you click on the detail of receipt activity, again, it's going to give you this little prompt before you do anything else. Are you doing a file upload or do you have hand posted records? If you click hand posted records, it's going to tell you no upload is required for this item. So if you're going to if you do the file upload, then that's when you'll go choose your file and select it and upload it. It's going to be the same for the disbursement activity, and it's just because of the volume of that to try to make somebody go back and upload that much information when you've got hand-posted records is, is just a little too much where a computerized system, you could probably generate a report that will have that, that same information. All right, we have another question about that um, minutes link. How long do we need to maintain that link on our website for the monthly minutes? I don't know. Um, I would think do, it would be I wonder if they, I don't know how, nor, how long you normally keep them. Are they on there just for a year and then you repeat the next year? Um, I would, I would think at least back until the last audit that we would want to see those if, if, um, it would have to be four years if we don't get around it. Yeah. So that would probably be a minimum of four years. If for some reason you took them off after some point, therefore the link that you've uploaded here in Gateway wouldn't be valid and we clicked on it and saw that it was an invalid link, we'd probably contact you for for whatever we were looking for. But that's another thing maybe we can address further. And Susan's taking notes, so we'll we'll talk about that. All right, thank Great you. Great questions. Wanted to show also the annual earnings record. You'll still get this prompt. If you have hand posted, you don't need to do anything. On the vendor history. It doesn't provide that narrative there, but if you go to the free, uh, go to the user guide on the vendor history, it says the same thing. It says if you have hand posted records, you don't have to provide this. So 
that'll probably be a change that, that'll get made in here. There'll probably be a prompt for either an upload or if you have hand posted records, we're probably not going to make you create a, a vendor history. But that's something that's been pointed out as we've gotten into this that that's not provided for there. So I think that pretty much covers going through um, uploading those those three documents on a monthly basis. Like I said, once you get them saved on your system somewhere, you can just go and select which ones you're uploading and choose that file and submit the upload and you should be done. Related to that, but um, more toward the audit itself, if you're having an audit done and it's being done off-site, Susan mentioned you're going to get direct requests from those examiners asking for things. So I'm going to go through that process a little bit, but since we're right here, I want to I want to show you what it looks like in Gateway, <clears throat> and then we're going to talk about some forms that are being sent out that um, are used in the planning of, a, of an audit when it's off-site, and then talk about that whole process, how there'll be an, an on-site entrance conference, and then we'll do work, and then maybe come back and, and do the testing and stuff. So let me show you what it looks like. Uh, you'll get an email that there's a direct request for a certain document. In fact, why don't I go to that? one and show you. Here's the one that was that was sent to me um, for the just the demonstration purposes. But as I said, it, if you can see right here, it says it's from a no reply at gateway email address. And as you scroll down into it, it'll say the Board of Accounts has requested that you upload a file into gateway for you know your test unit. And then in bold, it'll tell you what they're asking for. So they have requested for me a file on contract. And the detail is, please upload the test contract. So they'll give you some uh, generic information here, what they want, and then more detail in, in this section. So this one might say if it was you know, a real situation, maybe they wanted the contract for uh, Caldwell Landscaping, because they, they mow the, the yard, the grass at the library, and plow the snow in the winter, so they want to see that contract for whatever reason. They, they would put that in this area here. And then the instructions will be to log on to Gateway with a link that will take you right there, and how to go about selecting the direct request and uploading that information that they've asked for. And then they're going to give you a time frame. This one just says, please provide the file within three days. Uh, it may say a week. It may say two weeks. It may th they'll give you some kind of time frame. If, if there's a reason that you don't think you can meet that time frame, like if, if I knew um, July the 4th was coming up and I was going to take Monday and Tuesday of next week off and so I couldn't get this done in three days, that's fine. Just let the examiners know. So contact them. They'll, you should have phone number and or an email address to get a hold of the individual examiner is doing just like if they were down the hall in a conference room and and before you would have walked down and said I'm going to be gone I can't get this just email them and say you know why you aren't going to be able to get to it and and they'll work with you um, to extend that or, or do whatever they need to um, allow you to get that done. So don't think that, oh, that says three business days. If I don't get it, they're going to write me up or something. Um, that's just, the, if we don't put a time frame in there, uh, things will linger and linger, and then it'll be harder to track. You know, have we gotten this request yet? Have we not gotten that one? Um, and it'll keep the audit moving a little faster. So that's what the, the request is going to look like. <clears throat> I can go back to Gateway. The requests are down here at the bottom of the monthly and annual upload page. So you can see the one I just showed you actually said contract. That was one from last week. I had her send me another one today. It says contract two. And I have to go back up to the top. Where, where it shows the months, <clears throat> there's also a feature, so I'm going to upload a direct request now. And when you click on that, it, in this section, it will show you any direct requests you had. So if you had two or three, 
they would they would show up here uh, of which one you're going to upload. I'm going to upload that contract too because it's the one that they sent today. So it says please upload the contract for the engagement period. Um, I'll go over here to choose a file just like we did before. This one I do have a file for that. I call it a direct request. This is the contract. Go select on open. You can see it puts the name here again. And it abbreviates it a little bit if it's too long. They only had so many characters they could fit in there. I'll submit the upload. I got the message that it was successful. And like with the monthlies, I can go back down and see my contract two. We got the check mark, direct request contract, June 27, 305, by me. And I can even click on it and open it up. And it will show there's the contract that I uploaded. So those will be what you'll be getting when we're starting an audit. We're doing it offsite, and they're requesting records. It'll, it'll look like that. Um, they'll explain this again during the entrance conference when they sit down with you and go over how the whole process is going to work. So uh, this will be something that you know maybe you only do once every few years, so it may not be fresh the second time or as you're going through it the first time. But just get with your field examiner and they can walk you through whatever issues you're having or if it's a gateway type of thing you can contact our gateway help desk and, and they can help too that's that gateway at sboa.in.gov email address so when are these direct requests happening are they happening just during the audit process or any time the direct requests are going to happen almost exclusively during an audit process I am not sure if, let's say, you have uh, uploaded your bank reconcilement for the last three or four months, what's going to happen then, but we're probably going to contact you and f try to find out why. And so that may be through a direct request, or it may just be a phone call, or it may be a direct email you know, from an individual, not from Gateway. But uh, these direct requests are going to be during an audit for the most part. Then let me take a second and talk about some of those other forms I mentioned that are being sent out for the planning purposes. Uh, we've had some re questions about what those are. Um, some of them are very lengthy to fill out. Some people have said, you know, this is a lot of extra work. I thought all this remote stuff was going to make it easier. Um, these forms that we're sending out prior to the start of the audit are, are things we have done for every audit before. They're, they're information gathering mechanisms that we have to do in order to, to plan an audit under the standards that we audit under. Um, it, it may not look familiar to you because maybe the field examiner during your last audit sat down and filled out the information just casually speaking to you or maybe they had been on that audit you know, two or three times so they kind of had an understanding of how your library worked so maybe you didn't see it but um, going forward now because things are, are remote um, we're going to have you do that. I mean, you did it before. You, you provided the information. Maybe we wrote it down. Maybe you wrote some of it down. But So it may look new as, as we go through them. But I just wanted you to know that it's not additional work. We have done what these forms required during every audit before. As I mentioned, they were um, necessary under the standards that we, audited, that we audit under. So I wanted to read a quote from those standards that require us to do that. It says, the objective of the auditor is to identify and assess the risks of material misstatement, whether due to fraud or error, at the financial statement and relevant assertion levels through understanding the entity and its environment, including the entity's internal control, thereby providing a basis for designing and implementing responses to the assessed risks of material misstatement. So you probably heard us say before when we were talking about internal controls is that we're going to come on site, gain an understanding of your internal controls, then we're going to test those controls to see if they're working efficiently and if they are or aren't, we use that information on planning our audit procedures. If your controls are, are good controls and they're working like you think, we can reduce some of the testing that we do. If, if you've got these controls, these policies in, 
in place or you think they're in place but we find that the testing isn't showing that then we can't rely on your controls we'll have to do maybe more testing to get us to a certain level of uh, comfort before we put an opinion on financial statements so the forms that that we're sending out oops, that's not the wrong one. let's start with those are the form 7 and the form 9 and the form 13 starting with the form 7 there's actually two versions of the form 7 there's a 7 and a 7a and what you see on the screen now is the 7a it's an Excel document and it is actually being phased out I understand but it's sometimes still sent so you might see this or you might not um, when I was out in the field I always liked this because it was a um, it lists various um, duties in, in different categories and so you could see who did what at a unit it was a good way to visualize that um, I created this form for we did this training for cities and towns a few weeks ago so you can see I've, I've called this the town of Toddville uh, it could be the Toddville Public Library now so it's it's one of the best libraries in the state and uh, uh, Susan is our is our director and she's the one that filled this out so if you see this form you were listing the employees for a particular area let's say it's your your front desk type area but where you've got cash collections or whatever but you would list people here and then you would go down and assign each of these areas on the left who did what and what was their priority for example open mail and write receipts and this says employee number two that was their primary or their number one job and that was me so I had to go get the mail post office every day and open it and write receipts if there were checks or whatever if I was gone then employee number three did that that was he was the secondary person that was Charlie pride and then if neither one of us were able to do it then Susan would would go do it and find time to go do it so this form I think is good to look at because these are some uh, control type of things that maybe you haven't thought of like opening the mail versus receiving money um, taking out the cash register if you have one, balancing a drawer, making up the deposit. What you can find when you've got it all on the on paper here is if you have a bunch of ones under one person, so that's their primary responsibility, then you've got one person doing a lot of these tasks and maybe you need to segregate those duties a little bit. You've probably heard us talk about segregation of duties. You don't want to have one person doing all of these things and like Bill even mentioned earlier sometimes that's not possible and you have to get some other people involved you know if you're a, a really small library and you're the one doing it um, everything you may need other people involved so again if you see this form that's what it's helping us do it's helping us understand who does what at your library and I'm going to scroll down to a couple of areas where I that we see some um, common issues with not only libraries but cities and towns and the other units that we <coughs> audit you get down especially in smaller ones uh, preparing the bank reconcilement and approving the bank reconcilement you can see at the Townville Public Library Susan does both of those things that's an internal control deficiency there she has the ability to prepare that reconcilement and no one else is looking at it she's she's kind of approving it or reviewing it that should be segregated out that if she's going to do this function then somebody else should be doing that that function Todd are you going to make these forms available since I guess they only get them if they're going to be audited is, is there an opportunity to make them available on your website yeah we had that question last week and and that's something I think we're, we're going to do is, is make the especially this one like I said that I like and the other ones that are a little more involved in coming up with an answer so maybe if you had some more time to, to kind of think about um, some of the responses I think that would be good but yeah I think we're going to try to make this available here's another area that we see some commonality with internal controls approving the gateway annual report and preparing the financial statements that that again shouldn't be the same person so sometimes we've seen where the person that that has financial records they might throw everything in the gateway and hit submit and no one else ever looks at it so you should have someone else involved in that process and at the Townville Public Library um, that Susan's primary responsibility is to approve the gateway annual report 
and then it is the person in, in, in employee number five, which happens to be the town council in this situation, or this would be your library board. So Susan was inputting this, that information, and then the board was approving it. So you had another set of eyes on it, and not just one person. So these forms are fairly recent, I guess. Someone said that in 215 they never received these, and uh, this year was the first time I'd heard about them. Yeah, you, you may not have received them before. They're, they're, the forms themselves are not new, and the information on them isn't new. We have done them probably behind the scenes before, and, and I think maybe when we look at some of the others, that'll be a little more evident that um, this form right here um, was last updated in August of 2014. But I know back when I was out in the field, you know, 10 years ago, I was using it. So it's, it was just one that you may not have always seen. You have a question in the room? Is that a question? No, I said that the forms were available to download. The ones that these yeah, the, the question in the room, the statement in the room was these forms were part of the materials that are available for download on our website, but I think I just put the first page. Ah, okay. Like if you look, I think this probably only goes down to maybe cash disbursement somewhere. Is there a second page or is the whole thing there? Okay. Oh, good. You've got it. So, I'm not sure on the Word documents I did that because some of them are seven or eight or nine pages long, but but some of the material, so what you're seeing on the screen was in the handout so you could download if, if you wanted to, or we we still might make you know blank forms available under the meeting materials on the uh, State Board of Accounts website under political subdivisions and then libraries. So are, are these just for our internal evaluation to set things differently if we'd like, or do we have still assess them depending on the way? You're going to be filling these forms out and sending them in somewhere. So you'll be providing them to the field examiners as they plan your audit. So they're, they're going to need to know who's opening them, these type of things. And like I said, this form, I, I, after I presented all this or prepared it for the cities and towns that we, we did recently, learned that, that they're no longer, or the plan is to no longer send this form that you're looking at right now out, the 7A. Uh, but the form 7 and the form 9 that we're going to talk about here in a second, um, are forms that you'll be getting, filling out, and returning to someone. Okay, so they'll send them to when we're supposed to fill them out? Yes. Okay. They will send them to you when you are supposed to fill them out. So okay. when they send them to you, they are they are putting the, the, the process of the audit as starting. Okay. Do you have a question? So, but we do have the whole, this whole document if we just want to use it, I would like to yes. use it. Okay. Yes, you can have that whole document if you just want to use it for your own purposes. That's why I said don't be surprised if, if I guess some people are still sending it out, old habits die hard, I guess, on the you know, old time field examiners. Um, so they might still be sending it out, but I think it's phasing out. So yeah, you could use this just for your intel. And that's why I wanted to show it to you, because I think it's good to see um, some of these areas. And oh, I hadn't thought about this, this, and this all being in one person. Maybe I can break that out and have somebody else do this instead of one person doing all three of these things, those types of things. So let me move on to form seven itself. <laughs> It is a Word document, and this is the part that you'll see. See, I mentioned it, this is page 1 of 11, so this is where the, the lengthy narrative kind of stuff comes in. But the title of it is Understanding the Design and Implementation of Internal Controls at the Entity Level or at your Library Level. So this is, this is where we'll start to understand the five components of internal control you've heard us talk about ad nauseum. What, what you've got in place, um, what actions you're taking, there are questions here, and you'll provide the answers and we'll just evaluate those and help in planning the audit. I actually took this one from a from a town, so I just took the name out of which town it was, but these are the actual answers that they put highlighted in yellow. And again, I'm not sure I provided all 11 of these pages, so I'll scroll down through them, but just answer them the best you can. They don't have to be overly wordy. Just get some um, get something down that if it applies to you, if it doesn't apply, just put not applicable to us and maybe a brief explanation of why not. But you'll see as it goes on and on and on, it'll ask for 
different types of things. See, we're in the risk assessment. Um, now we're in the, the information and communication. That's one of the five components. So it'll go through all five components. And um, then on the second, then when we get that back, there's a part two of this form that we have that we do not provide to you that we will evaluate your answers and, and come up with some evaluations of your entity. And the form nine is kind of similar. It's titled Understanding the Entity and Its Environment. If you remember from the quote I read from the auditing standards that we do, or that we audit under, that, that those words are exactly used. Um, that we have to identify and assess the risk, um, including, you know, through understanding the entity and its environment. So that's why this form is called Understanding the Entity and Its Environment. So it's, one of, it's going to want to ask what, what um, functions your library provides. Again, this is for a town, so the one that you get for a library is going to look different. But it takes um, into consideration maybe some economic impact or issues in, in your community. You know, if um, the major factory in town just closed down and, and people are moving out of town, then the you know, um, circulation or the people that you get coming through your library on a daily basis is going to go down. That can affect how your library operates. You may have to lay people off or um, not have some of the services you've had in the past. So again, it's get some information in there if it applies to you as you scroll through the form when you get it. If, if things don't apply, you know, put in A, that type of thing. And that will help us, again, understand your, what's going on in your library and help us design our testing of your internal controls based on what we know. The last form that you should be getting is a Form 13. I say the last form. Um, you might actually get it first. So just because I said last doesn't mean you'll get it at the end. This is the, it's the Form 13. And the reason you're getting it is because in January and February, when you're inputting your financial information in the annual report and you submit that in Gateway, we then take that, those, num those dollars and cents, and we um, compile them or massage them into a financial statement. And the standards that we audit under also say we can't, we can't really compile your financial statements and then turn around and audit them. So this is the document that says, yes, these are my financial statements that you're accepting responsibility for, that these are the numbers that you put into Gateway. It will um, go through each of the financial statement areas. So here's the statement of receipts, disbursements, and cash balances. And it's going to ask you, is the beginning cash, and we'll also send you your financial statement. So when we've done that massaging or that compiling, we're going to say, here's the Form 13, and here's your financial statement. So you can see, okay, yeah, my operating fund balance at the end of the year is the same thing I put in the gateway. The beginning balance is the same thing I put in gateway. And that's what you're going to initial to here. But the title of the funds are reported correctly. You know, if you have a uh, different fund than normal and, and you've called it, you know, the uh, Caldwell Family Trust or a Caldwell Gift Fund or, or something like that, did it get on the financial statement that way? And you'll initial next to this like Susan did for the... Townville Public Library. You also get your notes of the financial statements. And it's going to ask, is the, fund, is the unit name correct through, you know, some libraries can have, uh, you know, not just as simple as the Toddville the Public Library. Maybe you have a really long name or a complicated, um, maybe it's part of township, but we want to make sure the name is, is consistent throughout. And then you're just signing it and saying that you've reviewed the financial statements and the notes. They were prepared, you know, by the use of your books and your records, and that um, then we're going to be auditing them. And this is something that you probably should have seen the last few audits, um, but we did have some people say they didn't remember it or they weren't sure they ever got it. So you should see this type of form too. If you're getting this in your financial statements at the same time, then you'll know that the audit is is very near to beginning. Any questions on any of anything that, that I've talked about? Any the monthly uploads or the annual uploads or the direct requests when you're going through an audit or, or any of these forms? 
I think I would just want to stress on the Form 7 and the Form 9 again, there's a lot of words there. There's a lot of places for you to put words in. Um, it will seem like it takes a long time, but then on subsequent audits, you only need to update those. That's what we've been doing. This is not really new information we're asking for. Like I said, we may have discussed it verbally with you during the last audit, but we were filling, we've were we been filling these Form 7s and 9s out for many years. So I know some people have, like I said, thought, well, we're, we're doing this remotely, but you're getting us all this extra work. I, don't, I wouldn't consider it extra. Uh, it might seem like extra this first time, but it is stuff that we've had to obtain from you in the past. So try to keep that in mind, and I think the process will go smoothly. So if there are no more questions, I'll turn it back over to Susan. Well, one question oh, okay. about the annual cash um, and investment statement that the is there any chance that the state law will ever change to allow the upload of the annual cash and investment statement to Gateway instead of publishing in the newspaper? Uh, I have a statute that, or a, there's an interim study committee that might address that. Okay. There is an interim study committee that might address that, is what Susan Gordon says. And she's going to cover that in her legislative materials that she is getting ready to do. Oh, after the caps. Yeah. So is that back to the That's where I was? Oh, where you were? I think she, I think that got closed. Why is it trying to connect? Okay, thanks for your patience again as we did that switch over there. Uh, there's a couple of other topics we need to discuss here at the in the last half hour or 25 minutes or so. Um, the first one is corrective action plans. I just wanted to touch base with everybody on that. Uh, if you remember from last year, uh, if you were at our training, our communications officer came out and talked about a new statute on the resolution of audit findings. Um, and this is that statute there for you to, to look at at a later time. And what the statute said or says is that if you have a, a comment in a report that's currently on file and our auditors come and then they do an audit and you still have that same issue and they repeat that in the next report, then you have to file a corrective action plan with our agency. So that's what that law is about. It does have a time frame of six months to get that uh, plan put into place, and we'll talk about what that exactly means here in a minute. Um, if the finding is not resolved by uh, a policy or maybe there's an impasse or something, then the Legislative Audit Committee will be following up on that um, so that they can see if some other action is necessary, maybe a legislative change or, or something of that nature. But I wanted to go through with you, um, last, last year when Tyler was here, our communications officer, uh, he was kind of talking about it theoretically of what we were going to be doing, but now we've had almost six months of accepting corrective action plans, so we're in full swing now and uh, kind of tweaking the process as we go along. But if you find yourself in the position of having to file a corrective action plan, um, <laughs> there is a way to do that on our website. Uh, there is a template there that you would use to uh, file a corrective action plan, and it does guide, th guide you through a series of seven uh, questions. Um, I wanted you to know, too, after that's done, our communications officer will send your corrective action plan to Todd and I, and we will take a look at that. And we, we actually put a lot of effort into this. We will be looking at the old report, and we look at the current report, and we look at the work papers uh, and your corrective action plan all together uh, to see if we can help you resolve those issues. So 
Uh, we do, do take that very seriously, and during that process, you probably get either a phone call from us or an email from us asking questions or uh, just trying to make sure that we can get that resolved uh, so that it doesn't come up in the future. And then uh, the acceptance, when we, when we feel like the, the plan that's going to be put in place will actually resolve the issue and you should not have an, a further comment in the report on that, uh, we can go ahead and accept that plan. And then there'll be verification in the future with our field examiners uh, that that plan actually was put in place. If, it, if there's a, a way that Todd and I can verify that the plan is put in place, uh, then we'll go ahead and take care of that ourselves uh, so the field examiners won't have to have that as part of their audit time. Uh, one thing we wanted to make sure everybody knew is that we are committed to try and help you uh, resolve these issues, and that, that is our goal throughout this whole process here. In that vein, um, one thing that we'd like to recommend is if you, uh, the, the best way to <coughs> get started, excuse me, <coughs> the best thing to do is to go and review your prior audit reports now, the one, the, the last one that you have on file. We'd recommend that you go take a look at that. There's the website here. You just select audit report and then search by name and see if you have any audit results and comments or examination results and comments or if you had a compliance review, if you have any comments in your compliance review. If you have comments in those reports, then please address them now before the examiners come in. Maybe create your own internal correction act, corrective action plan. And that way when the field examiners do come in, then you'll be able to show them that yes, you've taken steps or put policies in place to resolve those issues. Um, and that will just, again, help your audit to go much more smoothly. If you do have uh, comments in your reports that are on file right now and you would like to call us and talk to us about that or email us, uh, we'll be happy to try and help you find some potential solutions to those issues. So on creating a, an effective CAP, the, um, the website will walk you through a series of seven questions, um, and those are here in this presentation. It'll ask for you to state the issue, list the requirements that were not followed, provide a response, identify the root cause of the issue, and I'll go through these individually, um, what steps you're going to take to resolve those issues, and your timetable, and then a summary of how it will correct the issue. That's kind of the template that's available on our website uh, so that you can go ahead and um, prepare a corrective action plan. So I wanted to briefly talk about each one of these components here of this type of a plan. Uh, on clearly state the issue, um, it's just simply asking the question, what happened? And that is always uh, in your first section of the finding that you have in your report. Uh, our examiners write a condition paragraph and that will say, uh, for example, transactions were not recorded timely or appropriations were exceeded, um, bank reconciliations were not performed, etc. So you can restate that uh, in your own words. You can add information if you would like to do that. And then on the section of listing the requirements that were not followed, it's basically answering the question, what should have happened? And that, too, is also contained in the comment in the report. It is always the second half of the finding or the last half of the finding. And it will always be based on a statute or a uniform compliance guideline. The uniform compliance guidelines are, is, are our manual. Uh, the entire manual is a uniform compliance guidelines. Uh, if you would like to hone in on a few of the most common uniform compliance guidelines, that would be in Chapter 1 of the manual. Also, state examiner directives are um, a uniform compliance guidelines. As far as your response, that's just a simple I agree or I disagree with the finding. If you disagree, uh, Todd and I would appreciate it if you would go ahead and elaborate as to why you disagree. Because uh, if you remember, we're looking at the old report and the current report and the work papers, and we just want to make sure we have a good picture of how everything is operating um, so that we can get the issue resolved uh, as quickly as possible. 
Now, identifying the root cause of an issue is uh, something that uh, is difficult to do. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of give you an example. That was just that cartoon was just supposed to be funny about the uh, real reason you're late for works because the cat was setting the clock back. That was the root cause of that problem. But um, as far as your concern for the corrective action plans, um, it's it's asking a lot of questions of why, and sometimes you have to ask the uh, question why more than one time to get down to the real problem. And I just have an example here of that. Um, if, if there's a report that has bank reconciliations that are not performed, um, the, the first question is, well, why were the bank reconciliations not performed? Well, the answer might be, it was not going to reconcile, so we didn't do it. Well, okay, the second why, why would it not reconcile? Well, it wouldn't reconcile because the ledger wasn't posted properly. Okay, well, why was the ledger not posted properly? Well, we got behind and we made errors, so we just quit because we did not know what else to do. Well, why did you not know what else to do? And the answer was because we had no system in place to tell us what to do. And that would be digging down to the, to the real cause of the problem or the root cause of the problem. And as you might imagine, most of the comments we see will boil down to some kind of a standard operating procedure or, or a best practice or an internal control procedure. Uh, that could be put in place so that uh, the issue did not happen uh, again, or there would at least be reasonable assurance that it would be prevented or detected. So on the steps to be taken to correct the issue, uh, we have listed here the internal control components. We wouldn't expect that your corrective action plan would detail each internal control component, but we just had them here on this slide so that you could kind of see that they do play a part into the corrective action plan that you might um, submit. For example, in your control environment, that would be a policy that you would have in place to correct the issue. Uh, risk assessment has already kind of been into play. It's been uh, in a report or two now, so there's obviously a risk of error there. And any control activities you have would prevent or detect those errors. Monitoring would make sure that your, um, or help you to make sure your controls are functioning properly. And then information and communication would be um, how that information is shared. So with the corrective action plan, uh, you are creating a policy most of the time, something to be added to your procedures manual. Uh, it has to be more than just we'll start doing bank reconciliations now. OK, we get it. We know. It has to be more detailed than that. So we'll be looking for an assignment of responsibility for those bank reconciliation. Uh, we'll also be looking to see if there's a segregation of duties with the, um, the other uh, transactions that go into that bank uh, reconciliation. And if there's not a proper segregation of duties, and, and you know we all know one person office can't have segregation of duties, then we're going to look for a compensating control for that. You know, did a, a board member or someone else review your bank reconciliation? So that's the type of policy we're looking for in a corrective action plan, something that should correct the issue, and also how you're going to be documenting that process. For example, if the board member reviews the bank statement, the board member's going to um, evidence, evidence that by signing the bank statement or sending an email that says they reviewed the bank statement some evidence that shows that the procedures you put in place were actually done. On the timetable, uh, six months is what's in the statute. But what that six months means is it's a six month period that you have to have your policy put in place. You have to implement your policy in that time period. It doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be evidence of the outcome of that policy in six months. And my best example of that is on the annual financial report, at least right now. Um, if your annual financial report had errors and there was a comment on that, you could go ahead and institute a policy within the next six months that says what you're going to do to prevent or detect those errors. We won't know the outcome of your policy or whether it worked or not until March 1st, which is beyond six months. But what we're looking for right now to satisfy this resolution of audit findings is your policy. 
And then finally, just a summary um, of how the procedures will resolve the finding. So as far as resources, if you are in a situation where you have to file a corrective action plan, um, our field examiners will dis discuss this with you during the audit. They'll discuss it with you at the exit conference and provide a package of information on preparing a corrective action plan. Our office is currently working on best practices documents to help uh, complete a corrective action plan. Todd and I are available to help you with a corrective action plan. And also, too, again, if you want to try and just go ahead on your own and resolve findings from previous reports, uh, we're available for that, too. Does anybody have any questions on that? Okay. We'll fly through the legislation here if I can get to the PowerPoint. Help me out here, Karen. Hi, How do I'll I? help you out. Will you help me out? Thank you. I wish I was better at this. You're doing fine. Let's see. I think it was, it was F, F, I think. Okay. Oh, no. There. Is that yours? Yeah. Is that yours? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. There it okay. is. Thank you. Okay. And so then we're just going to present it. So we do that and then. You're all set. I've been spoiled so far. Every presentation I have to make, someone does that for me. I don't know what I will do if I have to go out on my own. <laughs> so, okay, newly enacted legislation. I'll go through this fast. I know it's at the end of the day. Um, and I know also that Sylvia prepares probably a wonderful document that, that gives you all of the information. But just a few things from our perspective we'll go through here uh, pretty quickly. Uh, Senate Enrolled Act 392. Uh, talks about public records. If you have those in an electronic format, um, a, you can provide that in electronic format if the requester, ask, requester asks for it in that fashion. Uh, you're, if you don't have it in an electronic format, then you are not required to make it electronic if someone requests that. But if you do have an electronic copy, uh, then you shall provide that if they request it that way. There's also a statute that prohibits charging a fee for providing a public record by email um, in most cases. House Enrolled Act 1004 on public works projects of less than $50,000. In the previous statute, if a project was less than $50,000, you had to, in, wait a minute, if, a, if a project was between twenty-five dollars and $50,000, you had to invite quotes by mail, and then that had to be uh, not less than seven days before the time fixed for receiving the bids. And then if you had a project of under 25000 you could solicit quotes by telephone or fax. Now they've changed that to allow you for public works contracts of less than 50000 to obtain quotes by telephone, fax, or electronic mail, and you don't have that seven-day waiting period anymore. There's also some requirements in there for uh, the drug testing program for the contractors. Um, and this is the interim study committee I mentioned. I know they're setting that up. If you're interested in the publication of legal notices, and I know you all are, um, you may want to contact uh, your representative or someone to see about that interim study committee and maybe having some input there. But they will be studying the publication of legal notices. House Enrolled 1036 uh, is on unemployment compensation. If you find that you're in a situation where you have to collect an overpayment of benefits uh, that was made by the Department of Workforce Development, then you can collect a fee of $12 for each time that they, for each, each um, overpayment they ask you to collect. Uh, House Enrolled Act 1109. Uh, there are several PERF-related um, changes here, but the, the main ones on rollover distributions, uh, now non-active members can make a rollover distribution into their annuity savings account. Um, also on annuity savings account withdrawals, 
it allows a non-active PERF member to suspend their fund membership, retain their credible service, and withdraw all or part of the amount in their annuity savings account before retirement. And then if your library would just happen to become start becoming a member of PERF, then it changed the deadlines, the old deadlines of January 1 or July 1 to a date that's approved by the NPERS Board of Trustees. House Enrolled Act 1257 gives a little flexibility if you purchase from a nonprofit agency for individuals with a disability. The old statute uh, had the wording individuals with a severe with severe disabilities. They've now changed that to individuals with a disability. Uh, I, I'm assuming so that more agencies would qualify. Um, so there are some purchasing benefits to that in 5-22-13, uh, where you can purchase supplies and services without advertising or calling for bids from one of those qualified agencies. House Enrolled Act 1262, if you have an ordinance where you uh, your board has allowed investments in CDs, that are with depositories that are outside of your territorial limits, but still with a depository approved by the State Board of Finance. The, um, the time period has changed from a two-year ordinance now to a one-year ordinance. There's also the tax intercept program. Uh, if you have fees or um, money that's owed to you by a taxpayer, you can um, apply with the Department of Revenue and they will uh, put you into the tax intercept program where they can intercept those fees for the tax refunds. And that will go through a clearinghouse and into the local government investment pool in an account in your name, in your library's name. And the, the lit rate county council can impose a tax rate under lit, under the lit expenditure rate of between 0.1% and 0.2% for the purpose of uh, new correctional and rehab facilities. And that money will be distributed directly to the county first. There's a question by what you mean about <coughs> ordinance for CDs? This would be in a situation where you have CDs that you have purchased that are, um, for example, let's see, there was no depository that uh, offered CDs maybe within your territorial limits, so you went outside of your territorial limits to work with a depository that was approved by the State Board of Finance. In the old statute, an ordinance that approved that, and I'm sorry, I used the word ordinance, for a library it would be resolution. For a resolution that authorized that um, for a two-year period, they are now shortening that to a one-year time frame. So I apologize for the ordinance uh, language there. Uh, House Enrolled Act 1316, there's now an exemption from state gross retail tax for personal property sold by a public library or a friends group uh, for transactions occurring after June 30th. Somebody wants to know, is that with that lit for correctional facilities, does that have an effect on other entities? It does because the entire lit expenditure rate, the all of the funds, um, that they will take that right off of the top of that ex expenditure rate funds. And that will go to the county first, the 0.1 or 0.2%. So it's not an additional? It is not. Well, it depends on the way the county structures it. It doesn't have to be additional. And that question about CDs, is that something they have to revisit every year? They will have to revisit that every year now, yes, instead of every two years. And again, that's only for CDs that you've purchased uh, that are not with depositories within your territorial limits. <coughs> yes. We will check on that. The, the question was on the tax intercept program, if it would apply to 
let's say library fees that someone might owe, owe for overdue items or damaged items is that what you're asking um, and um, I will have to check on that and we'll have that in uh, Karen's frequently asked questions and we'll try and get that answered for you how I, will, how will the other entities know their reduction regarding the lit for jails that will be passed through the auditor of state that is that I think that's where that information will come from but we might have to put that in your frequently asked question or your asked questions too and find out I may have to ask our county supervisors that question okay and then if the CDs are within our territory can they remain to your CDs that statute change only applied to those outside the territory all right thank you This is, uh, I'm sure you all know about this one, House Enrolled Act 1412 about making the Indiana Historical Bureau a division of the Indiana State Library and a whole lot of organization, reorganization going on uh, under that bill. There were some changes also in this bill regarding the petition and remonstrance process for the establishment of a public library or the expansion of a public library. And then in also in 1412, there was some language change where the library board can assess fines, penalties, and damages for uh, damage to a library property or material. And that previous wording was for injury to library property or material. And then also the issuance of local library cards. Um, it used to say that uh, a local, the library board can issue local library cards to an Indiana resident who's not a member of the library district for a fee. Now uh, that person does not have to be an Indiana resident, um, but they can issue cards to individuals who are not residents of the library district. So I, I know it's because all of those people that live on the border of Indiana just want to come to our libraries because they're fabulous. OK, let's see. And then 361210, um, dealing with the leasing of library property, it just clarifies some of the language um, in that statute. If you have want to see these bills, I'm sure you all know this, but if you want to see these bills, you can go to this website um, and click on bills and then um, type in the number if you want to see any of those in their entirety. Just a couple of other things. Uh, we'd like to thank everybody for filing their annual financial report and 100R on time. Uh, again, with these um, the the new uh, technology that we're using in our audits, these these reports have always been important, but it's uh, becoming even more important that those are filed in a timely uh, fashion. So we appreciate everybody's work on that. Um, our office has instituted for uh, units across the board, not just libraries. If there is a late filing, then it's an, it automatically results in a finding in the report. Um, and if, if it keeps going on and uh, we can't get those filed, um, there's a subpoena process to try and get that information submitted um, into Gateway. Mm -hmm. I just want to address the question about those library cards. That, uh, does that mean there's no more reciprocal cards? It really is not about reciprocal cards. It's about interlocal agreements between states. And if you look at the uh, bulletin that was sent out by Sylvia Watson, it'll explain that further. OK, yes, thank you. Um, so anyway, we want to thank you for your attention today. If there's anything at all that Todd and I can do for you, um, Please call us or email us, and uh, we'll, we'll do the best we can to get uh, the answers that you need. All right. Those people who are in the webinar, I've now opened the file window that has the certificate in which you can download the certificate for this afternoon for your LEUs. And before we close today, we have Jen Clifton, the supervisor of the LDO, who will give the Indiana State Library announcements. Hello, I will get us out of here by four, I promise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think I remember the link. Yes, there it is. 
All right. So I've just got seven quick little announcements. Let me see if I can find this one. OK, so you may have seen the State Library is now hiring a resource sharing coordinator. I'm really excited about that because I'm currently sharing these duties with another um, colleague in my office. So the deadline to apply for that position is on um, July 5th, so uh, just a little over a week. And that is a professional librarian position. Uh, speaking of resource sharing, the new Info Express service year will start next week. So um, I think all but one public library have gotten your renewals in, so thank you for that. If you have changed your schedule or added days, uh, that will start next week. So please let us know if something goes wrong and you miss a delivery or, um, or your schedule didn't change as you planned. The Differences U conference is scheduled for July 20th. That's here at the State Library. And registration is full, but I believe there's a small wait list. So we've heard of a few people uh, bumping up from that wait list to the, the main list. So. Not all hope is lost for that. It's a great conference. We, um, Speaking of conferences, we also have a Inspire 20th anniversary celebration that is scheduled for August 9th. And that'll also be here at the State Library. We'll have some speakers from some of the uh, various vendors, Gail, EBSCO, Teaching Books, and more. And there will be giveaways, special guests, and cake. So um, we will also be announcing some ENA broadband meetings as those will be held statewide, I believe, later this summer or early fall. Uh, the Indiana Memory DPLA, or Digital Public Library of America Fest, is scheduled for Friday, Friday September 21st at the Indianapolis Public Library. The uh, DPLA executive director will be there to speak. So if you're interested in digitization and what people are doing around the state, uh, be sure to sign up for that when that's posted. And then finally, my last announcement, our communications department is working on preparing the public library and state library annual reports, those little colorful booklets that you can share with your staff and your board. So uh, we're hoping to have those out before the end of the year this year. So uh, those should uh, arrive via Info Express in September. So all that's right. all I've got. All right, I think that does it. Uh, it does, does, does this mean that a person from Illinois or Kentucky can purchase a library card? The answer is yes. Okay? And that's it for today. And I know people ask me about the archives. They won't be available till next week because I have to close caption them. And hopefully you all got your LEU certificates to download. But if not, email me. And I will be sending out a survey. So look for that.